Good morning, everybody. Man, I can't believe that it's already December 20th. Can you believe that? We only have five more days left until Christmas. That's crazy. Let me ask you this question. Okay, how many of you are already done with all of your Christmas shopping? I mean, you have no more uh, stocking stuffers to get. You are all done. You don't have to pick up anything. You are all done. Okay, like we have like five Six people. Okay, now let me ask you this. How many of you have already seen Star Wars? Would you raise your hands? Wow! Now we know where our priorities are. For some of you men, this is what I've realized. 7-Eleven has some great last minute gift giving ideas, if you were wondering that. Well, we are right in the middle of this series called, Oh, Come Let Us Adore Him. And we've been talking about worship as the wise men came to worship Jesus. The wise men actually demonstrate for us different postures of worship, and we've been talking about that. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about this idea of lifting our hands up in worship to God, that this is an offering that we make before him, that sometimes we can feel self-conscious about this, but this is something that actually pleases the heart of God. As we reach out to God as God is reaching back out to us. Last week we talked about giving our gifts as a form of worship to God as well. That when we make sacrifices before God, we're making a, we're, we're, we're having a, a show of faith, aren't we? God, that you control everything, that you own everything, Lord. And today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about this one idea of bowing down before God. We're bending our knee before God. We're going to jump right into the scripture today, if that's okay with you. So if you have your Bibles this morning, why don't you turn to Matthew chapter 2, verse 7. Matthew chapter 2, verse 7. And let me even kind of explain to you what exactly is going on as we read verse 7. What you will find is that these magi, or these wise men as we might know them, they're religious leaders from the area of Babylon. They've been guided by the way of a star to find the baby Jesus so that they can come and worship him, right? Now this is what I think, and I could be wrong, but you guys are going to have to research this for yourself. I'm pretty sure that one of the wise men had to have been a woman. You know why? Because they stop and ask for directions at King Herod's place. <laughs> Obviously no man in the world would stop and ask for directions. But you have these magi, they stop at King Herod's palace and they ask him, where's the one who's been born King of the Jews? Now what they don't know is that the Roman Senate gave him that title King of the Jews and all of a sudden this very violent, this very insecure man becomes threatened. And so we know this, that he wants to kill every baby boy underneath the age of two years old. Why don't you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word this morning. <clears throat> Verse 7, it says this, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, and said, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to put you on a little mission for me. Go and search carefully for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me, so that I may go and worship him too. He's lying. He actually wants to kill him. Verse 9, after they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them and went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they did what? They bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. But then, having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. You guys can go ahead and have a seat this morning. <clears throat> so here we have the Magi. They're making their way to Jesus, and they're bowing down to Jesus, and that is going to be their form of worship. Not only have they brought gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, but another form of worship that they show us is that they actually bow down before him, right? Now, whenever you and I picture this scene, you and I usually picture the Magi bowing down before the baby Jesus, don't we? 
And why do we picture that? We picture that because that's the scene that we see on every Christmas card, right? The wise men bowing down to the baby Jesus. Why do we picture that? Because that's what we see in every nativity scene. The wise men bowing down to the baby Jesus. But did you know this? That many scholars believe that Jesus was actually a toddler by the time that the wise men showed showed up. Did I just ruin Christmas for a whole bunch of people right now? Did you know that? Because I want you to think about this for a second. This is what a lot of people believe. That yes, the star showed up in the sky when Jesus was born. But then you and I forget that the wise men were in Babylon at the time. 900 miles away from Bethlehem. So the star appears. The wise men, they gathered up their belongings. And they get ready to then walk the entire length of California for them to go and see the baby Jesus. And many people believe that Jesus was about two years old by the time this happened. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus was a toddler. Why don't you turn to your other neighbor and say, say what? <laughs> verse 11. Why don't you look at verse 11 with me? Verse 11 says this. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and they worshipped him. You know what verse 11 tells us? Verse 11 tells us that the Magi came to a house and not a stable or a cave where Jesus might have been born. It tells us that they visited a child and not a baby and this is what we know that Herod wanted to kill every baby boy underneath the age of what? Do. A lot of people think that that's not a coincidence. Okay? Now for me, that just ruined my whole idea of Christmas. Honestly. Well, it at least changes it. Because for me, can I tell you this? I used to judge every single parent who had a two-year-old. Man, I used to judge you parents like crazy until I had a two-year-old of my own. Right? I mean... Before I became a parent, I knew more about parenting than anybody else. And I would, I would, I would watch your family in the restaurant with, a, you, with your two-year-old banging his fist on the table, grabbing his mashed potatoes and rubbing it all over his face. And then when the parent went to go take him outside, all of a sudden he'd go limp. <laughs> I would watch you and I would be like, I'm going to do so much better of a job than you when I'm a parent. You know why? Because I read Baby Wise. You know, I read all the books. I watched all the videos. I had the special edition Super Nanny Naughty Chair that you could turn into an electric chair if you really, really needed to. I mean, I was set. I was set, okay? And then I had a two-year-old of my own. How many of you have a two-year-old right now? Would you raise your hands? How many people have a two-year-old? How many of you have ever had a two-year-old? Go ahead and raise your hands. It, it, it is amazing to me how this small little child can break the spirit of two grown adults. <laughs> until you're at the place where you're like, I'll give you anything you want. You want candy? I'll give you candy. You want money? You want a race car? I'll give you a race car, whatever you want. You know what? I've heard somebody say that two-year-olds are like tiny little crackheads. <laughs> their clothes are dirty when you look at them. You know, their teeth are missing. They walk around like they're drunk all the time. A two-year-old can do what no other person in the entire world can do. They can stare you right in the eyes, never break eye contact, and then take a dump right in their pants. <laughs> that is not human. Tiny little crackheads <laughs> is what they are. And here you have a scene that, that's a miracle to me. It almost rivals the virgin birth, honestly. That here you have something where these men of nobility, these men of stature, these men of knowledge are traveling this entire distance not to be with somebody of their like, 
You and I do that. We like to be with somebody else that we respect. We like to network with other people that are going to make us feel better about ourselves. And yet, that's not what we find with these wise men. Here they come, bowing down to a two-year-old, worshiping a two-year-old, which, which would seem to be the oddest thing in the entire world. But do you know why they do it? Because they know that he is God. And so here you have these wise men and they're bowing down to Jesus. And that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about kneeling in the presence of God. Now as a culture, we're not really too familiar with kneeling. That's not really something that we do all that much. I think in other cultures around the world, they might be more familiar with bowing or kneeling um, before other people. But that's not really something that we that we're all that familiar with. I think maybe men, maybe we bow like twice in our entire lives. You know, we kneel once because we get down on one knee and we ask the other person to marry us, right? And we're going to make out in about 15 minutes, so we're okay with that. <laughs> and the only t other time that we kneel is when we take football pictures, right? <laughs> we got, got our football right here. We got a helmet right there. I don't know if women ever kneel. Uh, uh, every, ever bow, honestly. You know, they don't, have, they don't have to ask the other person to marry them. They don't take football pictures or anything like that. I mean, they do kind of do this thing in pictures. <laughs> but that's, that's not kneeling. That's not kneeling. And, and I think part of the reason why, why, why bowing and, and, and kneeling is so, so foreign to us is because I think fundamentally you and I do not fully grasp something about the character and the nature of who God is. See, when you and I truly begin to understand who God is and what it is that he's done for us, what you will find in the scriptures is that bowing is a natural reaction before him. That when you and I come to know exactly who he is, the most natural reaction for you and I is to want to get as low before God as we possibly can. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about this, that on, on one hand, that our desire as we come and worship God is that we want to come and we want to lift our hands to him, that we are reaching out for our heavenly father. And as we draw near to God, God will draw near to us, that we want to be with him, that we want to be like him. But then when we get a glimpse of, of the glory and even a glimpse of the power and the majesty of who God is, and we can't help but to avert our eyes before God, understanding that no one may see God and even live. And that's what we even learned from the story of Moses. Moses says, God, I want to see you. God, I want to know you. I want to be closer to you. I want to experience you. I want to see your glory. And God says, I love it. I love your heart. I love your passion. But because I love you, I just want to let you know something. You just can't see me and live. So as I pass by, I'm going to protect you in the cleft of a rock. I'm only going to allow you to see my backside because of that very reason. It's a natural reaction on our part that as we get a, a real glimpse of who God is, that we can't help but to get down before God. Psalm chapter 95, verses 6 through 7, it says this. Oh, I love this. I love, this is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. You guys remember that old uh, praise song? Remember? Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. Okay, none of you know that, apparently. <laughs> For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. There's, a, there's an interesting Hebrew word that's translated as worship. It's the word shacha. Would you turn to your neighbor and say shacha? Not to be confused with shaka Khan. <laughs> it's a reference for those of you who have lived during the 80s. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, just, just let it pass by. 
Shaka, this word is used 170 times in the Bible. And it, and, 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 it, and it translated, it means worship, but it more than just means worship because innate within this word is the idea of a physical posture as we worship. That as I worship God, that I am bowing down before him, that I am lying prostrate before this God. 170 times in scripture we're told to kneel before God in worship. Now you know what I think is interesting? What I think is interesting is that there is, that I cannot find, there might be, but I cannot find one place in the Bible where God actually commands us to kneel down before him. Let me explain that for those of you who want to question me a little bit. What I'm saying is this, that there are a lot of times in, Bi in the Bible where, just like Psalm chapter 95, where the psalmist will invite us to bow down, the psalmist will encourage us to bow down, but never once do you see a scene or a narrative in the Bible where God decides to reveal himself in all of his glory, and then people just kind of stand there like this. And God's like, oh, you, you're supposed to bow down right now. I don't know if you knew that. Just want to give you a heads up. You're supposed to bow down right now. No, everywhere in the Bible what you see is that whenever God reveals himself in all of his glory, what you will find is that the most natural reaction that everyone has is they cannot help but to fall on their faces before God. Now, what I think is interesting is that God never commands anybody to fall on their face. It's just kind of natural. What God does do over and over and over and over though is he just commands us not to bow down to other gods. And he commands us not to bow down and worship other idols. We studied, we just got done studying the Ten Commandments. The second commandment is, is this. Exodus chapter 20 verses 4 through 5 says this. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below or in the waters below that you shall not, what? You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I the Lord your God am a jealous God. Brazilian jiu-jitsu is pretty popular these days, isn't it? And what you'll find is that whether it be Brazilian jiu-jitsu or judo or UFC fighting or wrestling, all of these sports have this one thing in common, don't they? They have this one thing in common where you can do this, right? You can tap or you can tap out. What does that mean when somebody taps out? That means they give up. They surrender. They submit. That's it. I don't want anymore. And, and, and I have an eight-year-old child. His name is Caleb. Caleb is uh, one of my favorites. However, <laughs> one of my favorites. However, I tell him that, I, I don't tell him this, uh, but I say, Caleb, you, I say, you are so stubborn. He is the most stubborn kid I have. And in fact, when I tell him, Caleb, you're so stubborn, you know what he says? He says this, I'm not stubborn. And I was like, if you weren't stubborn, then you wouldn't be fighting with me. And he goes, I'm not stubborn. Okay, now, now, as a dad, I've written him a song called the CB Song. That's his nickname, CB. And every time I sing it to him, he loves it. He loves it. Like, if I sing him the song, the CB Song, and I rub his tummy, that's one of his favorite things in the world. Okay, now, but, but when I ask him if he likes the CB Song, what does he say? No. I don't like the CB song. So I go, okay, that's all funny. You know, that's all fine and dandy. So daddy's going to kind of amp things up a little bit, right? So I get him down on the ground, and I start tickling him, and he starts laughing. And I go, okay, Caleb, do you love the CB song? And he says, no, I do not love the CB song. So I tickle him even more until he's about to wet his own pants. And I go, do you love the CB song. And he goes, no, I do not love the CB song. How many of you have a children like that? Would you go ahead and raise your hands? You got a stubborn child. All I'm trying to say is this, that you do the same thing to God. And that I do the same thing to God. 
That you know what? God has this wonderful plan for my life. God has wonderful hopes and dreams and a direction for my life. And I say this, God, I love it when you inspire me. I love it when I go to church and I get my little warm, fuzzy feelings. I love being supported by the people of God when I'm, whenever I'm going through a hard time. But you know what, God? When it comes to that command, you're on your own. Because I'm living my own life and I'm doing my own thing. And for many of you, what you'll find is this. There is one area of your life where God has been knocking on the door of your heart. God has been knocking on the door of your finances. God has been knocking on the door of your children. And yet you will not Listen, you know what I find? How God speaks to me most clearly? Through my wife. But there's so many times where, you know what? I don't want to hear it. I don't want to do that. And yet what you will find is that even Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus, being the King of Kings, in the Lord of Lords, if you think about this, he was born into this world to die, right? I mean, that was his mission. To come into this world and to die for our sins. And he knew everything that was coming down the pike. He knew all of the agony that he would face by bearing all of our sins. He would, all of our sins would be placed upon him. That all of our regret and mistakes would be shouldered by him on the cross. That all of the loneliness and the isolation that we've ever experienced would be placed upon him. That all of the hells that you and I ever deserved would be placed upon him. So much so that God turned his face away from him so that Jesus would suffer the terror of dying on the cross without the presence of his heavenly father. Jesus, although he knew all of that stuff, yet he still responded like this. In Luke chapter 22, verses 41 through 42, it says this, speaking of Jesus, that he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them. He knelt down before God and prayed, Father, if you were willing, take this cup from me. And yet the most famous words are this. Yet not my will, but yours be done. What was Jesus saying? Jesus was saying this. I tap. God, I don't want to suffer the agony that comes from the cross. But I submit. I submit to your will. Because I love my people, because I love your people so much that you know what, God, that I will willingly surrender to this plan. And you know what, all I'm trying to say is this, that maybe this Christmas time, that's exactly what you need to do. To just say, you know what, God, I tap out. I surrender myself wholly and completely to you. You know, because what you'll find is that kneeling is not just about the posture of my body, is it? Kneeling isn't just about the posture of my body, but it's about the attitude of my heart. Am I willing to give everything to God? Oh, that one thing that I hold on to that I just cannot control, that stresses me out and makes me go crazy. Can I tell you this? You cannot control your wife's attitude. You cannot control the decision that your children are going to make. In large part, you can't even control maybe how much your boss decides to pay you. And you know what? Some of you and I are just going to have to give up on some of those things and surrender to whatever it is that God has for us. Because what you will find is this. Sometimes kneeling before God is the only way that you and I can have the strength to stand. Amen? Amen. Sometimes kneeling before God is the only way that you and I can have the strength to stand. And maybe, maybe this Christmas season, what God is telling you is this. That you know what? I want you to take care of your elderly parent. And you're in a situation where you're saying, you know what, God, I've finally gotten to the place where I have a little bit more space in my life, a little bit more time, a little bit more finances. I don't have time for something like that. And God says this, man, I want you to, 
I want you to tap out. Maybe God is saying, you know what, that you need to surrender to my will for your relationship. Maybe what God wants you to do is God wants you to tear up those divorce papers. Or maybe, maybe your marriage isn't necessarily in trouble. But maybe you haven't found yourself necessarily in the habit of praying every single night with your wife. Praying every single night with your wife. Praying every, and maybe God has just been knocking and knocking and knocking saying, are you going to do that yet? Are you going to follow me yet? Maybe God is saying this, that I want you to just tap out. Would you just get baptized? It's not that big a deal. And you're fighting God saying, you know what, but God, I'm already a Christian. I already have you inside of me. Why on earth would I get baptized? And my hair is going to get all wet. I'm going to get emotional. My mascara is going to run everywhere. And God is saying, you know why you need to get baptized? You know why? Simply because I ask you to. Is that enough for you? Is that enough for you? Even if you had no reason behind anything, is your reaction to God, hey God, yes. I, I, don't, I don't know what you want me to do, but the answer is yes. Is that the kind of obedience that we show in our lives? See, maybe, maybe God wants you to submit your finances to him. Maybe God wants you to have a conversation of forgiveness with somebody else. You don't want to spend... Christmas with that person. You don't want to be around that person. And maybe God is saying, hey, you know what? But I gave my life for you. I did not withhold anything from you. So here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to withhold anything else. That, that person's family. Would you just go and have a conversation with that person? Shine the light of Christ in that way. I got a little secret for you. It's this, that you can either bow before God now or you can bow before God later. But the truth of the Bible is this. That we all end up bowing before God. Whether it be now or whether it be later. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 9 through 11 it says this. Speaking of Jesus. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. And gave him the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus. What? Every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess or acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what we want to do today. To say, God, that I surrender my life to you. I submit myself. I bow my knee before you now because either I will do it willingly now or I will do it unwillingly later. And so here's what I choose, God. Before the real fight has to happen, God, I really I want to submit my heart before you. Why don't you bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, that's exactly what we want to do, Lord Jesus. There are certain areas of our life that we hold on to. God, and why do we do that? Lord, why do we do that? We know that it doesn't add to our lives. We know that, Father, that it doesn't actually do anything. So why must we be the ones who are in control? God, we're all constantly edging you out. And as we're praying, some of you might be like that. There might be an area of your life that you're trying to control. There might be some stress and worry that's going on in your life because you're trying to control something that you were never meant to control in the first place. And maybe God is saying today, here's what I want you to do. Would you just let it go? Would you just let me take care of it? Whether it be your job, whether it be your marriage, whatever it is. And there's some of you who would say, yes, you know, that's me. I need to surrender that area to God. If that's you today, would you lift up your hands? If that's you, man, I want to pray for you. I'm like that. Would you lift up your hands if you would say, I got an area of my life that I'm holding on to and I shouldn't be. Lift them up. Lift them up. That's right. Lift them up. God, I want to thank you, Father, that in this holy moment that you are doing a work in our church, God, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would work inside of us, that there would be less of us, and that there would be more of you, God, that just like God in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, that you gave everything up to God. Father, that is what we desire to do as well. God, give us 
the ability to kneel before you, not just physically. Father, give us the ability to kneel before you in our hearts today. You guys can go ahead and put your hands down. And as you keep praying, as you keep praying with every head bowed, there's some of you, and you're going to recognize this, that you have never, ever knelt before God. And what I mean by that is this, that you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, that you're still the Lord of your life, that you're still doing it your way. And maybe today is a day where you say that, God, that I want to surrender not just an area of my life to you, but God, I need to surrender everything to you. This is what I know from Scripture. When you call on Him, Scripture says this, that God is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And years from now, you're going to look back and you're going to say, it was during the Christmas time that I knelt in surrender before God. If that's you today, and if you want to tap out to Christ, would you lift your hands right now? Yes, that I surrender my life to Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the Heavenly Father, that I want to give you everything, that I give you my life. There you go. Raise your hands up for the first time ever. You want to say, God, I surrender my life. I surrender my all. I surrender my everything to you, God. Father, would you heal me and would you make me anew? Why don't we do this? Why don't we all, can we all pray this aloud together with every head bowed? Why don't we pray this aloud? Thank you, God, for coming and dying for me. Let's try that one more time. Thank you for coming and dying for me. It is only through you that I can have life. And so I surrender to you. I give my everything to you. Lord, be my leader and my Lord. I love you with all of my heart. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said,